Who, what, when, where, why? With Harry Reasoner. You remember Bunny Hobson? Oh, yes. Bunny Hobson was uh, an inspector of my camp here in the The two men you see walking behind me are the only living five-star generals in the United States Army. Dwight D. Eisenhower, the 34th President of the United States, was a Supreme Commander, Allied Expeditionary Force in Europe during World War II. His West Point classmate of 1915, Omar N. Bradley, was the G.I. General in Africa, Sicily, Normandy, and on to victory in Germany. General Bradley has just returned from Vietnam. In the former President's office in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, we talked to Generals Eisenhower and Bradley about Vietnam. Gentlemen, most conversations about Vietnam these days begin with a, a classification of the people talking. Uh, would you say you are hawks or doves, Mr. President? Well, I'm uh, neither, and I'm certain that General Bradley is. Matter of fact, I don't think our country is. And that's the reason I deprecate the use of the word uh, for the individual. A uh, hawk is a predator, and neither the individual nor the United States wants to seize somebody else's property. And a dove is usually a helpless prey of a predator. I don't want to be either. Would you agree, General Bradley? Yes, sir, I do, exactly. What about this new committee that I believe you're co-chairman of, General Bradley? It's called the Committee for Peace with Freedom? Well, some of us have felt uh, for some time that uh, the whole picture is not being presented to the American public. The tendency in news is to uh, print the sensational and the bad. I suppose that's what people buy papers for or listen to TV for about. But uh, they leave out the good part of the war and why we're fighting and what we're fighting for, and the morale of the men, the good parts, they don't print. We think a committee can do some good. Help present the whole picture and let the people understand it, and when they understand it, they will be for it, we think. Would you say, Mr. President, that this is the most unpopular war the country's ever had? Well, I think in many ways it is, but remember this. We have not declared it a war, and therefore, um, uh, all discussion can be very argumentative and, uh, and is completely free. But historically, look at the number of people that were killed in New York City during the Civil War in resisting the, ad the uh, draft. And um, there was a tremendous movement for peace in the North. And uh, what you aptly call the doves of that day, if they'd have had their way, we, we'd have been a fragmented uh, continent and certainly no nation like we are today. As well as the war being somewhat unpopular, a lot of polls indicate that people don't approve of the way the president is handling it. Assuming we've got the war, do you think he's handling it properly? I don't believe anyone is in position that isn't uh, living this problem all the time to uh, criticize in detail the conduct of this war. Now, uh, John Bradley and I had quite a bit to do with one war, and we both of us have been criticized, I think, for what we did or didn't do. But the critics didn't know the problem. They didn't know what the situations were then. And none of us, I think, can really live this thing. But I do know this, that there are always going to be critics of the conduct of the war during it and after it's done. And I think that most of them would be better uh, advised to wait and look for the facts and do more thinking than, rather than talking. I'd like to get back to the history of this for a moment, Mr. President. The one of the things we hear a lot about is your famous 1954 letter to President Jam offering help. Yeah. Uh, how did you see that at the time? Did you envisage a military operation? Well, it didn't at that time for this reason. Laos was causing him much more trouble than the Vietnam. And when I turned over to uh, President Kennedy, I had two long talks with him about that uh, situation. But at that time, Vietnam was not giving us real concern, except that Jim, uh, he believed in nepotism. He trusted his uh, sister-in-law and his brother, and that's about all the people he would talk to. And we were trying to correct that situation. Otherwise, we weren't that worried at that time. I think there's another thing that has been confused in people's minds, was the fact that we did not sign the Geneva Accords. Well, uh, this has uh, been called a, a great mistake. Actually, we at Geneva pledged in good faith, that we would support the decisions that reached there about the protection of this particular, or this general area. 
But I, after talking with uh, Foster Dulles, I suggested to him myself that we not sign it because I didn't want to put my name on some paper that was surrendering a considerable area, and it is a considerable area, to the communists. And I believe that would provoke them only to further action. And uh, while people like to, to uh, deprecate and make fun of the uh, so-called domino theory, I think there's no question whatsoever that any success by the communists just breeds the opportunity for the next success. And uh, you can see where that could happen in uh, Asia if we let it go. After the Geneva Accords, there were elections scheduled for 1956, and the assumption was that Ho Chi Minh would have won them by about 80 percent. Now, we were instrumental, I think, in seeing that those elections were not held. Was that the reason, sir? Well, I think it was rather the uh, uh, Jim himself probably said it just wasn't time, but I think we agreed to it. But there's this about it. At that time, we had a dictator that was now controlling more than half the country and uh, with a great deal of his population, and he would get 100% of the vote. Now, uh, Jim would have to take a, the elections absolutely be free, and so therefore the, the whole thing would uh, probably be uh, free. Now, on the surface, they might uh, have been free all across the country, but not with the communists operating as they do in the areas they were then occupied. 